The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this episode are that of the guest and host and do not necessarily reflect the values of sponsors or other associated organizations. Welcome to the Parental Compass, presented by Family Education and Support Services. I am your host, Bobby Williams. Please, subscribe to us on Apple and Spotify. That way you'll get notified every week when we drop a new episode. We bring them every single week. We're talking about a serious issue today. Domestic violence and its impact on children. Here to discuss it with me is Cheryl Steins. Cheryl worked for 30 years with the Thurston County Sheriff's Office, mainly focusing in issues of crimes against children or domestic violence cases. We explored the issue, talked about its impact on children, and the next steps that you as an adult can take. I think you're really going to get a lot from this one. Check it out. You know, we can make excuses about domestic violence all day, but one thing that you've said to me that really stuck with me is this idea that violence is a choice. Explain that idea to me a little. Well, we make choices every day in life, and um, I always use the example of if you were ever, if you were really mad at your boss, would you hit him? And, and most people say no, because you're going to get fired or, you know, you won't have a job or you'll get arrested when you're mad at your friends, you don't hit them. Um, so there are contributing factors, you know, being drunk or being under a lot of stress, you know, that kind of enhance it. But violence is still a choice. You still choose to hit the one person that you claim you love. Um, and for example, if you're drunk or high and you molest a child, that's never acceptable. Mm -hmm. But if you're drunk or high and hit the one person you love, people make excuses. Well, he was drunk or high. So it, it, we, make, we make choices every day. We have financial problems. We don't rob a bank. Yeah. You know, we don't do things because we know yet in, in family violence, we know it's wrong, which is why we tell people to keep it a secret or not to tell anybody. We still make a choice to hit or hurt the one person or family that we claim we love. Yeah, but domestic violence isn't always just hitting someone, right? Like it can take a lot of different forms, I'm sure. Yes, yes, it can. What does that look like? Well, there's um, there's psychological, and in all the victims, um, I can almost say probably 100% of the victims that I've talked to, both men and women, that that psychological control or that psychological damage is more detrimental to them or more dam damning to them than any physical abuse because bruises heal, but words don't. And in a psychological abuse, there's that demeaning, it's that you know, um, you're a horrible person, that's the humiliation, uh, it's that psychological control. So there's psychological, there's threats to children, not only necessarily threats to harm children, but threats to take children. There's mm -hmm. isolation, you know, where you are pulled away from your, your family and friends because they don't necessarily approve of what's going on. There's that psychological abuse kind of goes in with all of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Social media, it's a, this is a new way of controlling. Um, you can kind of spy on people through social media in a way. You can spy on people, but what about controlling them by, they did a survey with some teenagers, um, a couple, well, had to be about five years ago now, but asking them why is it when somebody sends you a text when you're in a relationship you have to respond right away no matter what you're doing and the response was they get mad at me mm. they they don't believe me when i say i'm out with my family they want to know where i am what i'm doing and i'm and i'm not responding right away so what that what's happening is they're changing their behavior 
puts that person in control. So well, yes, it's, there's stalking and there's that. It's like you can never really truly be alone or something. Uh, something I've talked with people about is the idea of gaslighting too, of an abuser will be like, well, you're the abuser, or it's like you're someone making you feel like you're this awful person. And then it almost drives you crazy if you don't know what to think or something. Right. It, it, it's that psychological control. It's putting the blame. It's never accepting blame. It's always putting the blame on the other person. You made me do this. Yeah. You made me, you know, angry that I had, that I did this or, you know, and so it's putting the blame on them. It's, it's that control psychologically. When, no in, accountability. In a, yeah, no accountability. And a person, you know, doubts themselves. Did I say something wrong? Did I do something? Maybe if I wouldn't have done this, this wouldn't have happened. And so they take that blame. Yeah. And then it's like, well, am I just crazy or something? Yes. Uh, the, the question everyone asks about these situations is, well, why doesn't the person just leave? You know, you hear that all the time. All the time. What's your response to that? Well, I tell people that there's a lot more involved in leaving than just packing up and leaving. Mm. Um, there's that psychological component of it. If there's children, you know, what are you going to do with the children? What if you, and, and I'm right now, when I'm talking, I'm focusing on women being the victims because majority of the victims are women, although there are men who are victims. Um, but what if you don't work? What if you've been staying home, taking care of the kids and you don't know where you're going to live? You don't know what you're going to do. You haven't never had a job. You've just, you know, and so there's that. And then there's, I don't want to fail. I love him. He's going to get help. There's a whole psychological component to just picking up and leaving. It is not easy for these, these victims to do that. Yeah. Going to the idea of children, we talk a lot on the show about how your children are always learning from your example. They're always really paying attention. What kind of a message does domestic violence send to a child? A lot of, a lot of messages. Um, things like, you know, I can act in terrible out of control ways. It's okay to hit someone as long as you apologize because there's that cycle of violence that happens. And there's always after the violence, there's always what they call that honeymoon phase where as long as you apologize, you know, it's gonna be okay because it becomes acceptable in the home. Um, they don't learn how to compromise. You know, they learn that there's a winner and there's a loser. One person is con in control and the other person has to listen. Um, Boy, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of different um, things, but mostly they're learning that violence is okay, and mm -hmm. that's how you get you you know threats and intimidation. It's how you get your way. Do you think that makes it more likely that they'll be abusive people as adults? Well, that cycle of violence is something that continues from generation to generation. Um, if they don't have the guidance and the, um, because there are, there are many kids who don't become violent, but I think, you know, those are kids that have somebody healthy to be there for them. Hmm. Um, I always ask in my classes, who's been a victim of domestic violence, who grew up in a home of domestic violence. And normally it's half the class. Yeah. So, you know, and they remember, and I, we talk about what they remember and their feelings as a child. And so they're all continuing in that cycle. Yeah. So let's get into that then. What can someone do to help their child so that they don't become an abusive person or get in a domestic violence relationship as an adult? Well, I'm a firm, firm believer in counseling. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can find a counselor who specializes in children and has a background, um, you know, for for abuse and domestic violence, because they're going to really understand those dynamics. Um, although any counselor uh, would be helpful, uh, I think that children um, need were role models, mm -hmm. and you know they need to see good role models. Even if you've made mistakes, you can pull you can, you know, pull things together and become those good role models of what it's like in a situation. But the biggest thing 
is there, there should be no tolerance for any sort of physical anything, um, no physical um, discipline, because you can't explain the difference. You can't explain the difference of when mommy got hit the night before, that was wrong, but you know, mommy's gonna give you a spanking because you were misbehaving and this is right. There's just no way you can explain the difference to a child. Um, and what you're teaching them is you're teaching them it's okay to hit. Yeah. Spanking just seems to be such a controversial thing in society of you're legally allowed to spank your child, but you know, you can't hit adults. So right. I can see how that is mixed signals. I want to go back to the therapy idea. This is, I guess, a really simple, broad question, but why does therapy work? Um, because I think it, it gives you tools for your basket. Um, it gives you tools on how to deal with things. It, it, they're able to talk about feelings. You know, how, how do you feel when you see that or hear that? And then if you did that to someone, how do you think they're feeling? Um, I'm not a psychologist, but a child psychologist, um, I think really can delve into, because children do not have the life experience to perceive the world as we do as adults. Mm. They perceive it much differently because they don't have anything to draw on. So what a counselor does is they're a neutral party and they can give a child those tools to understand and and kind of, rat, not rationalize, but deal with what's going on. Kind of wrap their head around it somehow. Yeah, and I'm, make it, it's not their fault. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of other feelings that go along with domestic violence too, or children are probably more prone to depression and things like that. Well, there's fear. Okay, fear is a big one, right? When you're hearing people screaming and yelling in your home and even witnessing hitting. Um, so there's a there's fear, I think, is is the big one, but there's anxiety. What about guilt? You know, guilty. Um, let me, let's say the argument started about kids and then it progressed to, you know, arguments go off on tangents and it progressed, became violent. And the one thing the child remembers is that the argument was about them. Um, there's sadness, there's depression. What about being torn between loving both parents? Um, it, there's just so many different emotions that a child may, might feel and not understand and not know how to deal with. Another thing I think about too, is when you have domestic violence in the home, it has to be a big secret in a way, or you don't want your teacher to find out because they could call CPS. So that has to be a lot of pressure too, I'm sure. Yeah, that's pulling, that is definitely pulling a child into the adult world. It's funny because we talk about secrets in, in the class and not having, not telling your children to keep secrets because if you think about any time you keep, you tell someone to keep a secret, it's never good. And when, when I was raising my kids, I was working sex crimes. And the biggest thing about sex crimes against children is keeping it a secret. So I told my kids, no, we never ever keep secrets in our home. If somebody asks you to keep a secret, you come and talk to me about it. If you buy your brother a present, it's a surprise. Secrets are bad, surprises are good. Whenever an adult tells a child to keep a secret from another parent during a contentious divorce from the school because they don't want law enforcement or CPS involved, it's not a good thing. And you're putting the weight of the world onto a six-year-old's shoulders or an eight-year-old's shoulders. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Let's say parents split up how transparent do you want to be with your child about what's going on? Because on one hand, you want to shield them. I guess on one hand, they probably get a sense of what's happening too. Our kids are very aware. Yes, they are. I think that um, you got to be age appropriate, of course. And um, and you, you really have to be careful about how much you say, and you don't want to badmouth the other parent mm. um, because that's what we see a lot is that bitterness. And so you tell your child, you know, your, your dad's a horrible person. You should want anything to do with them, um, but you have to go see them. And then you grill your child when they come back. 
And then the other parent is doing the same thing. You know, your mother's a horrible person and you shouldn't want a relationship with her and tell me who she's dating and tell me what she's doing. I mean, you are pulling this child like a wishbone. It's, it's, um, it's very, very damaging to a child. Well, and parents can weaponize the child in a way too, or try to make it so the other parent can't see them or yep. things like that. They use those, they use the children as a pawn to get back at the other parent. I, they can't see past their own selfishness, you know, for what's going on to come together for their child. And, and the arguing and the words that are spoken, they're all done in front of the child rather than, you know, having the child at a neutral place. If you're going to argue, you know, in court, the child isn't there and you don't need to bring the child into you know, who's the better parent, because at that point, nobody's the better parent. Yeah, we we count on adults to be more evolved. But then so often, it's like adults, you know, everyone is still dealing with their own struggles through your whole life. And hopefully you get to a better place where you're more at peace. But it's always just an ongoing struggle that you kind of go back and forth on too. It is. I mean, and, and I'm not taking anything away from being a victim or, or being bitter or anything else. But at some point, you, you know, you've got to move on. And what, else, you know, let's talk about that message about how, um, you know, the other parents a bad parent. Well, most kids, school age kids, they know they're a product of both parents, right? Yeah. Or let's say that you look like one of the parents or you act like one of the parents or like my son's a carbon copy of his dad. Um, so if you're talking bad about that parent, good, bad, or indifferent, that child is going to think, well, God, she hates my dad so much, yet she tells me I'm like him. Their only conclusion is that she hates me just as much. No, oh, that's a, that's a sad thought. It just makes me sad hearing you say that idea. You know, I was talking to a friend the other day and he was saying, I'm kind of glad my dad wasn't in my life when I was a child because he needed to step away and work on himself. And if he was here, he would have just been a negative presence. Do you think there's any validity to what my friend was saying? I think there's some. I And I think that if, if you have a heart if you need that help and you need to be able to deal with what your issues are to become a better person so that you can go back and be a better parent then yes i think there is some validity i think that dads and moms um, are both very important in a child's life but only if they're healthy what would you say to a parent who right now is in the middle of a domestic violence situation what advice would you give them or what would you say to encourage them I would tell them to, you know, find that inner strength and, and reach out. There are so many services for victims of domestic violence and reach out and get some help. You need to have strong people to, to help guide you, to help to be there for you. Um, but you can get out. You, you, there, you can get out. And, and there are groups of, you know, that people it's not like it's not like AA, but there, but it's a it's a group where you know you talk about things and and I think people can help each other because um, you've experienced something and and you, you just need to know you're not alone. This was a really important conversation, and I just want to say thank you for taking the time to be here today. Oh, you're very welcome. Anytime. Thank you, Cheryl. A lot of wisdom in those words. You are the person that has the power to control your own life. Something to always remember. That's our show. I want to thank everyone who's been listening to help us build our audience here. It's been great seeing everyone's feedback. A big shout out goes to Family Education and Support Services, bringing you this show every week. This has been the Parental Compass. I am Bobby Williams. We're out, y'all. Peace.